message about marriage, a nine-year-old girl said that you don't know who you're going to marry before you get older. God figures out it out all beforehand, and he tells you later who you're stuck with. A 10-year-old boy was asked what he thought about marriage. He said, if, you, if you're getting married to somebody, they need to like the same stuff that you like. Like, if you like football, they should like it that you like football, and they should keep the chips and dip coming. That's what he said. <laughs> How many of you know he's in for a next, a next, a reality check? I can say with all confidence, based on the Word of God, that God always has a next for you. You could not sit back and ever say that that it's true that God doesn't have a plan, that God doesn't have a next, a next step for you. He always has a next because he's always been on mission. And his mission has been from the very beginning, I'm gonna restore all of creation, I'm gonna restore people, I'm gonna make all things new all of creation and all people. So he's been from the very beginning on a mission and then we join him in that mission. You remember the Blues Brothers? You old enough to remember the Blues Brothers? In the movie where they, they would, every time they would get introduced, they would say, we're on a, thank you, we're on a mission from God. I really can't say the God exactly right because it's a Chicago kind of thing. I have to go into a full-on, like, da bears, da bears, da bears, ditka, ditka. We're on a mission from God. There, I got it. Okay. I can't say whether or not they were, the Blues Brothers were on a mission from God, but I can tell you that if you've accepted Christ, it's not just a personal salvation, an individual transformation, but you've actually joined God, whether you knew this or not, and I didn't fully understand this, nor do I fully now comprehend it, but you've joined God on his redeeming, restoring, making things new, fixing broken things mission. That's why I know that God has a next for you, because he, he's on mission and he has a next for all of us. Maybe one of the passages of scripture that I've talked about more than any other in all the years of ministry, because it's so much fun to preach, uh, this, this passage is a passage that you probably have in your office or in your home, or you've got it on a magnet, or you got it on a coffee cup, and I just want to totally destroy this for you right now. <laughs> That's my goal. That's my mission today. I'm going to destroy this scripture for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, a future and a hope. And yes, I've preached on it and you've heard it and you have it posted around your house and it's a great scripture and it's a great passage. Now for the destruction. (laughs) Jeremiah is a weeping prophet. And in the history of the children of God, the story basically always has this same pattern. They go away from God. They go into captivity. He sends prophets to tell them how to get out of captivity, which is like start serving God again. And then they come out of captivity. God is always, and what they would do is they would actually hire false prophets, the kings would often, so that the false prophets would come in and say, it's going to be great. It's all wonderful. You're gonna, it's going to be fantastic. Peace is right around the corner. But in this passage in Jeremiah, the verse before it, he's basically telling the people of God, you're going to be in bondage for 70 years. Are you encouraged yet? You're going to be in bondage for 70 years, but don't worry. God has a plan. God has a future for you. God has a hope for you. And he was basically telling the people, you know, hey, might as well get some land and buy some houses, settle down. You're going to be here for a while. This is this great news. They were in captivity. They were heading into captivity. And Jeremiah tells them what is true from the Lord, which is I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I have a plan for you. I have a future for you. But that doesn't mean it's going to all be hunky-dory all the time. It's not all going to be perfect. I'm thinking of this right now because it feels to me, I don't know if it feels like this to you. Maybe it's just as a pastor. But I feel like sometimes... Okay, I'm going to go just on a tangent for just a minute, so just allow me this moment, okay? Sometimes I feel like, just between you and me and nobody else, that we almost try to oversell the gospel. 
Like, what's it going to take to get you into this Savior? You, you follow me? And, like, I'm going to make it so appealing, and it's going, to be, it's going to be so personal. Yes, it is personal. He gives us peace, and he forgives our sin, and he gives us a future and a hope. But he also coaches us and disciplines us, and we're also not just joining, like, individually, God coming into my individual life, but I'm actually stepping into an entire kingdom of other people, weird people. People that, are, that we're to be in family with and, and Jesus came and preached the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom means Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns over my thinking and he, he reigns over my emotions and he dominates my past and he dominates my future and he dominates my present. I am in his kingdom and where I'm in his kingdom, his, his kingship reigns and rules and dominates. Don't you love these words? Aren't these great words? And what do we get to do? Submit and obey and grow and go in process. And you're like, that's not selling me right now. I'm not feeling like I need to really join up. Why do we get in this kingdom? Because there's basically, you know, two kingdoms. There's yours, and you know how that works. See, some of you struggle with your life because when you go into your house, you think it's your dominion. And anybody who doesn't follow your rules and do your things and make you happy, then you're all upset. I'm little help for you as a pastor, if your life revolves around you, you're always going to be upset. Because <laughs> nobody, get this, nobody is always thinking about you as much as you are. Are you amazed yet that the people around you don't just line up and meet your needs? This is crazy. I thought that's what marriage was for. For five minutes. And I've been in training for 22 years since, and I know better. Your kids don't revolve around you. People don't revolve around you. As a matter of fact, the earth revolves around the sun, and when you get in God's kingdom, you revolve around the sun too. See, this is the problem with individualistic only thinking, and I think this is a, uh, it's global, but it could be a Western mindset too, where we tend to think individually. And the, the kingdom of God and the mission of God is corporately. And when you signed on for him, yes, you got forgiveness of sins and peace and grace and righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. But you're a part of an entire kingdom. That's why we can say God is on mission with us individually, but he's also on mission with us corporately. We've got next steps to take as a church. So it's not just, I'm going to get off that soapbox now, it's not just individually. We signed on to this whole mission of God thing. And it's not that it's going to be all wonderful and perfect and rosy. And there, there's this teaching out there. Have you all heard this? This idea that if you accept Christ, everything from this moment on is just going to be perfect. Are they serious with this? Don't buy into this. He's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you, but you're still going to go through some stuff. The good news is you don't go through it alone. Some people will falsely believe that if you, if you accept Christ, now there's no more trouble. And any trouble that you ever have is just a, a, a proof that your faith isn't strong enough. Are you with me right now? This is out there, folks. And it's just not true. The prophet Jeremiah was saying, God is going to be with you even if you're in captivity. He's going to be with you through the valleys, and he's going to be with you on the mountaintop. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you, and it's going to go well, and you're going to prosper even as your soul prospers. But, but he was basically saying, you're, you're still going to go through some stuff and some life. The good thing is you don't have to go through it alone. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When you accept Christ, he makes you new. This is what he does. This is how he makes things new. And he makes you new, and then you are a witness and a testimony to everyone around you of what Jesus can do with a life when they surrender their life to the reign of Christ and get in on his kingdom. So now all of us are ambassadors of his kingdom. Going around, the best proof I could give you, I mean, I could tell you all about Scripture and I'll do my best, but the best proof that I could give you of the kingdom of God, if you're wondering, is my, my own life. The best testimony that we could give as witnesses, one of the best testimonies we could give is that, that we could say, I could say, how many people in this room have had your life changed by Jesus Christ in real ways? Raise your hand. Okay? Man, dude, if, you're, if you haven't given your life to Christ yet, 
there's a great cloud of witnesses around you right now saying that he is true and he's, he makes things new. And then what do we do? We go around with this life inside of us, transformed by him, though we're not, we're not perfect, but we've been made new. And then we go around and testify to the world. This is what it looks like when you're in his kingdom. And so many were added to their numbers. Why? Because of the transformation of the people, but the transformation of the community together. Look at this community that loves one another. They're all different kinds of folks from different backgrounds and different languages, and yet they share this love and this bond of unity in the Holy Spirit. And it was so convincing as a witness. This is how God makes the world new. And this is why I know that he always has a next. God always has a next for his people, which means since you're his people, God always has a next for you. God always has a next for you. This really is my vision uh, for the church. I just envision a church where every single person knows where they are located in their relationship with God and other people. And they're allowing the Holy Spirit to prompt them, to encourage them, to invite them to that next step. And then you take that next step with God. We are hesitant to take next steps often. And I understand that. But I just, en I just envision a church where every single person is making that move. And, and saying yes to the Lord to that next area. You know God always has that next area for you. And just as soon as you cross one line with him and you feel like, Lord, I feel like you've really helped me in this area, what's he going to say? Got another area for you, Rob. I'm like, really? Because I thought we were good, you know? <laughs> no? We got more? And then what you'll do is you'll stand the precipice of that oppor opportunity, the opportunity for change, character development, and all the stuff that God wants to do in you. To, listen, he's on a mission to make you more like Jesus. And he's on a mission to make our church look more like Christ, to be that witness. Now, I know he has work to do. Why? Well, look at me. I need to look more like Jesus. And I know enough of you to know. You need to, you need to look like Jesus, too. Isaiah 43, 19 is another prophet telling the people of God while they're in captivity. Here's what, here's what the Lord says through Isaiah. For I'm about to do a new, uh, something new, a new thing. See, I have already begun. Don't you see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. This is when the, uh, this is another era of the children of God, but they were in captivity. I told you this is basically all of the Old Testament. They were in captivity, and Isaiah was sent by God to tell the people, you're going to travel 900 miles, and you're going to come into a promised land. I'm doing a new thing. You're coming out of captivity. Jeremiah was kind of prophesying before they were going into captivity. I have plans and I have a future and I hope for you. Isaiah is prophesying that they're, gonna, they're going to come out. I love new things. I enjoy new seasons. And every new season requires you to make adjustments. And I found that life is just a whole lot of transitions one after the other and in the midst of it I don't know why we're like this I assume that most of us all are like this but we're looking for that equilibrium we're always looking for like okay everything's in order now how many of you are super structured people you love order okay so that sucks doesn't it because life is never, have you noticed this? You're like, okay, and we've got that area of life figured out why is it going to hell in a handbasket over here? Huh? I mean, as soon as you get this part, kind of like, all right, and then the job blows up. And as soon as there is, and then as soon as you think you have everything, you just want everything to be nice and tidy and neat and orderly, time marches on. And, and things change. Life changes. And just when you get used to one phase that your kids are in, you're like, I'm pretty sure I can manage this annoying phase that they're in. Boom, they hit another annoying phase you know nothing about. You think, man, they're expensive, and then they get expensiver. <laughs> and you just get dumber. It's what happens. Your grammar goes, everything goes. Your money just flies away. 
Life is just one, it's just one transition after the other. There, I don't think there is any real equilibrium in all of that. You're, you're, you're wanting that, but it's a constant change. And you should probably just learn to embrace that with the Lord and say, it's a new season, Lord. And what do you have for me in this season? And, and, I, and I love when there's a new season. You get to rearrange things. You get to look at things in a different way. And I just want to encourage you that when you go into a new season, you can say, God, what do you have for me in the midst of this? I know you're growing me, you're changing me, you're challenging me, and I'm excited about this new season. Sometimes I really do believe that the Lord allows things in your life to shake up just so that you'll take account. And, and, and kind of get recalibrated and, and, and focus again on him and kind of start new. This is the way God is. God enjoys new things. He, he likes new things. There's new mercy every single morning. I think the angels that circle the throne, they're circling the throne 24-7. And every time they come around the throne, these angelic beings that look really weird uh, as John portrays them in Revelation, every time they come around, they say, holy, holy, holy. And I believe that every time they come around, they see something brand new about God they've never seen before. And they have to say all over again, wow, holy, holy, holy. This is what eternity, or eternity will be like with us where we discover new things about the Father. He's into new things. The enemy wants to lie and say it's boring, it's old, it's not going to happen, you're just stuck there, it's going to be forever, there's no way out, there's no way of escape. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there, is, there is freedom. There is one who is leading you into a broad place, a new place. See, he says, lengthen out and stretch it out. Why? Because God is bringing you into something new. This is what God likes to do. He's not, you're not going to be stuck there forever. You can be in a season, but they call it a season for a reason. That's because it's going to come to an end. I'm talking to somebody right now who feels like you're stuck forever. That is not the Spirit of God telling you that, that you're going to be there forever because God has something next for you. God has a new season for you. That's the way he is by his very nature. So today's big idea is this, looking at our past, looking at our past, you're like, how can I take this next step, helps us see our lives from God's perspective, and then to trust him going into what's next. To trust him to going into what's next. One thing that inspires my trust in him is to look back and see how faithful he's been. I encourage you this week at some point while you're reading Project 345 in the morning and I'm just so thankful that every single, it's just weird to think about all of us, thousands of people together every morning. I just have you in my heart when I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, it's not just me, it's 100% of the church reading their Bible. This is so awesome, Lord. Thank you. And I pray a special blessing on everyone who, uh, uh, you know, who's, who's reading, just so you know. And uh, maybe this week while you're reading, you'll just take account and make a list. God, I see where you were faithful here. And I remember where you were faithful there. And so I know you're going to be faithful as I take this next step, as you take me into whatever you have next for me. I was uh, uh, really thankful. I'm really thankful for my Catholic heritage. I was brought up uh, in a Catholic church when I, was, when I was little, went through catechism and went to Holy Cross school. And this was back when, I don't know if they're still doing this, but this is back when teachers could hit you. And if you deserved it, and, and I deserved it. And so they hit me. And, um, and it, I remember going through catechism. I remember my mom and I making this big felt banner for my first communion and that first communion. I remember as a kid, like, man, these wafers are pretty cool. And it didn't count because they hadn't, like, made it holy and blessed it. And so we got to eat all we wanted. This is things I remember as a Catholic kid. And, um, and, and, and I remember how my mom... I'm so thankful because it, it kind of ignited something in me. It re I realized that I have this desire to know God at that point in my life, even as a kid. Then my mom went to church with her sister on a Wednesday night. We as Catholics had never heard tell of that, that they had church on Wednesday night at these crazy churches, you know, these crazy churches that have Wednesday night church. My mom made the mistake of going to this crazy church on Wednesday night with her sister and got born again. She got saved. My dad said, from what? <laughs> My mom was a, a three-pack-a-day smoker, 
And my folks were, you know, partiers a little bit. And she just cold turkey quit everything. It ticked my dad off royally. If you've ever partied and you've been around a Christian, you're like, oh, brother. You know what I mean? Hey, this one's born again. Uh, I'll drink to that, you know. Get out of here, you know. <laughs> my mom had a, would, would smoke three pack, about three packs of cigarettes a day at the time. And, and um, I mean, we'd wake up in the morning and she'd have one going in the kitchen and one going in the bathroom and one going in the living room. You know, just forget that it's there. My sister and I would go around, take little hits out of the cough and take little hits off her cigarette, which is a miracle that we didn't die because this was in the days of teasing the hair and then this this hairspray and this fire. And it's like, how did we not blow up? I have no idea. I spent most of my childhood looking at the back of my mom's head for holes. Do you know You've got to be a certain age to know what I'm talking about. You got any holes back there? I take her pick. You know, she's going to kill me if I share this when it's live. <laughs> but man, she quit cold turkey. We had a basement where we had a pool table and we had a little bar. And, and I remember being down there as a kid and opening up people's drinks for them, you know. We're not talking about sodas here, folks. And uh, lighting their cigarettes for them. This was my childhood. We had, my dad had sacks and sacks of eight-track tapes. Come on now, Aerosmith. Yeah, Eagles, Fog Hat. I'm talking Cat Scratch Fever. Some of you know what I'm talking about right now. Some of you just felt the anointing of God in that one part, and that's it, this whole message. (laughs) And they were partiers. It it took my dad, I mean, it was six months of real hell for my dad until he surrendered his life to Jesus. And then I was about 10 years old, and I, I literally said to my parents when they told me all about this Jesus thing, I said, does this mean we can't have any fun anymore? That was my take on Christianity. It, my greatest fear was it was not going to be fun, it was going to be boring. And in high school, I, I just went away from God. It's not that I didn't believe in Jesus, it's that I was scared to death he was going to make me do something with my life I didn't want to do. It was a real fear. And I have to say right now, looking back, I was right. <laughs> in college, I was running away from him and It wasn't until I was about 24 and and going through a massive uh, nervous breakdown that I I was in a ditch along uh, I-74 in between Bloomington Normal and Champaign-Urbana. And I, you know, I was was trying to be an atheist, I have to admit, and going after all kinds of things. But there was a gnawing of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. And finally in that ditch, when I was at the end of my rope, I said, Lord, I know you're the Son of God. I just, I want you to reign in my mind. I want you to reign in my heart. I want to give you everything in my life. Lord, I'll do anything. I meant it. I'll go anywhere. I'll even become a Bengals fan, Lord, if that's what you so desire. I didn't know that at the time. I'm just saying that I didn't, I knew there was going to be a cost. I didn't know it it would be that high. (laughs) Oh, Bengals fans, we are, oh, I know. Now I know what you were talking about. This is the time of the season, it's called getting your hopes up. (laughs) That comes right before dashing them on a stone. (laughs) We'll get there together and we'll be okay. I gave my life to Jesus, I surrendered everything to him. And from then on, it was just perfect. And I lived happily ever after. There was never a problem, and I I never sinned again, and it was just lollipops and rainbows and unicorns. It was wonderful, and it has been ever since. No, man, it's been life, but it's life in the kingdom. It's life with a future and a hope. It's life with peace and joy and unlimited forgiveness and grace and mercy and power and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And his design and his desire and his blessing and sorrow and crying and death and life and pain and joy and all that goes into all of it. It's life with him. What other choice do we have? It's his kingdom or our kingdom. Which do you want? There's one true God and he has a kingdom. And you can get in on that kingdom and then live your life. Or, you know, I just, you can live your life under terrible management. You, and you know already that that doesn't work. I'm saying all this to say, it's not promising us perfection right now, but he is promising us salvation and the ability to be in his kingdom as his kids. When the children of God were about to go into the promised land, 
Moses has this one last chance to talk to the people. Of course, you know, he had a temper issue and he wasn't allowed to go into the, the promised land. And so he's got one last chance to talk to them. And he gives this really long speech uh, in Deuteronomy. And through the whole speech, he's taken people through all their history. And in, it's, fun, it's a fun read if you read through Deuteronomy because there are times where he just starts griping and complaining. Kind of like when I preached, I'm like, let me go on a tangent here for a second. He did this on and off through this whole thing. But his whole message through Deuteronomy to the people of God was remember Remember, remember, remember. He knew that they were going to take this big next step into the promised land. And he knew that when they were going to go there and they were going to take this step, that they, in order to have the courage to take the step, they were going to have to remember how faithful that God had been to them. They needed to look back and see how faithful that he had been so that they'd have the courage to go forward. In one of these uh, passages of the many where he says, remember, Deuteronomy 11.2, he says, remember today. What you have learned about the Lord through your experiences with him, you saw the Lord's greatness and his power and his might. See, <laughs> my faith is based on a whole lot of what, how I've experienced God. It's his word, but we've also lived with him. I have a God who's brought me out of some dark stuff. I have a God that I can, I can remember how he touched my mind. I can remember how he brought me out. I can remember how he didn't disqualify me for ministry. I am the last person in the world that should be standing here talking to you. Let me encourage you for a second. If you feel disqualified, this is wrong. If you've, you've gone through life and you've made mistakes and you've made bad choices and you've had failure, God does not disqualify you for that. He doesn't disqualify you. I was so shocked because I gave my life back to him and I'd been through a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of sin and, I'm, and I was feeling like this, like, Lord, I'll just do, I'll do anything. But I had no concept that he would ever allow me to do what he had called me to do from the very beginning. If you're divorced, you're not disqualified. If you've been abused, you're not disqualified. If you've done drugs and you have an addiction, you are not disqualified. Is there anything that can separate you from the love of God? Is there anything that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Isn't that the reason he came and died? Did he not bear all the sins of the world? Didn't he drink it down all the way down? Didn't he drink the last bit of all of it? He did. And he knew he would have to because that's what we needed. So get on with it. Get on with your life in him. You're not disqualified. I can look back and say, wow, he kept me safe when I didn't deserve it. I got myself in a lot of trouble, but I could have been in a lot worse trouble. He cared for me in those times, and he cared for you. Look back over your life and see where God's been faithful. Even when you didn't give a rip about him, he was still taking care of you, and he was still loving you. So how is it that we take this step? How is it that we, we're going to decide, like, okay, Lord, I, I know you have this next, and, and I want to take this step. How do we actually do that? Well, we, we have to go back for just a second and remember this story where Jesus is walking on the shore. And he's walking on the shore, and he's going to teach the people. The crowd is uh, surrounding him. And so he gets in a boat, and the owner of the boat is there, uh, Simon Peter. And, and he says to Simon Peter, this is so innocent. I just love this. It's like, hey, will you just, will you just hold this boat while I do this teaching? And um, I'm paraphrasing scripture right now. You know that, right? Okay. So uh, Peter, the apostle Peter says, before he's the apostle Peter, he says, yeah, he's just Pete, the fisherman guy. Yes, I'll hold the boat. Jesus teaches. And then he says, hey, why not launch out into the deep a little bit? Throw your nets down. And uh, Peter's like, yeah, we did that all night when fishermen fish, carpenter boy. He didn't say that. And now it's broad daylight, and the sun's beating down, and we're not going to catch a thing. But at, because you say so, we will. And so they go out, and they catch so much fish, the other boat has to come along, and they're all about to capsize, and they're freaking out. And, 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 and Peter is just like us, like, dude, I am so not qualified to even be in this boat with you right now. You are holy, and I know I'm not, and you're clean, and I'm unclean, and could you just go away from me, and we'll all feel better if you'll just go away. 
who in the world has power to do this kind of stuff? The teaching was great, but then this, oh my gosh, you know. And, and so Jesus comes to the shore and then he says, follow me. I'll, I'll make you fishermen of people. What does that even mean? What a weird thing to say. And they just, the nets that they were cleaning and the life that they had, they leave it behind. And they say, it's your kingdom. I'm going all the way, all in, all in with you. How in the world do we take those steps? And this is, I love this story because it shows the process that Jesus has you in. If you know Jesus, he has you in a process. And he started a work in you and he's going to be faithful to complete it. How many of you are good at planning stuff? Good planners. Any good planners here? You can plan things out? Good? I'm, just keep your hands up for a second. I want to make friends with you later. Okay? Good? Okay. How many of you would say, I'm a terrible planner? I'm just not very good at planning. I don't even know where I parked today. Okay? Yep. Isn't it great that, don't you love the people that are around you that know how to plan? And don't you just like totally, I hope that you do this, you're like, you just kind of, uh, you don't use them, you equip them for the work of the ministry. And you're so blessed because they're great planners. And if you don't know how to plan, you're just lost. You're like, if I'm two weeks out, I'm like, yes, praise God. And some of you are like, how good is God at planning? How good is he at strategy? Like, is he three weeks ahead? A month? Like 2,000 years to the day? Like, Scripture's filled with these times where it's like, and at the fullness of time, it's like, really? You planned that far in advance? He's a good planner, y'all. And he's got a good plan for you. He's a good coach. And he, listen, when you give your life to him, he is doing more than you are doing. He has a plan for you. Submit to the plan. The plan will be filled with all kinds of things and all kinds of experiences. But you can entrust him with the plan. Behold, I have good plans for you, a future and a hope. Submit to these plans. He's a good planner, and he knows you. And so why is it that it's so difficult for us? No matter how many times God is faithful to me, every time I step across, every time I'm about to take another step, I'm like, I don't know. You know, like I shouldn't know. I should of all people know that if the Lord's telling me to do it, I should just go, but I hesitate, and I have a feeling you're the same way. He has this next for you. You give your life to Jesus, and then he says, let's get baptized. And you say, I don't know. You know, get baptized. Then he's going to say, serve others. And you're going to say, I don't know. (laughs) And you're going to find incredible fulfillment in serving other people. It's crazy this upside down kingdom and then he's going to say be generous with your money and you're going to say I definitely don't know (laughs) all right there's always going to be this next how do we how do we do it by responding to God's invitation I'm just just respond to his invitation he's inviting you into his kingdom you say yes he's inviting you in the next step say yes this is it's it really is this simple this is how you grow in God Because you say so, I will. So, Lord, what are you saying to me today? Yep. As a matter of fact, I don't care even what you're going to say. My answer is already yes. Now, what's the the instructions? That's the goal. I'd like to pretend that I'm there. And it sounds so good to say. I'll just pretend that I'm there for a minute. You can pretend with me. That's how I live my life every day. (laughs) How else? Responding to the invitation and then by pushing out deeper. I find Jesus... I find the Holy Spirit to be relentless, calling, always calling. And I cross some line and I'm like, man, we're there, aren't we, Lord? No, we're not. Always deeper. This is the vision that we have for the church. You say, Pastor Rob, what's your vision for Vineyard Cincinnati? Here's my my vision for Vineyard Cincinnati. Pushing out deeper. Doing everything that God wants us to do together. And what's the last thing? The last thing is this. If you're going to take that step, you're going to have to embrace uncertainty. I asked last night at the service, why, are we so, why is it so difficult for us to embrace uncertainty? And one guy said, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> I'm telling you that no matter, no matter the transition that you're in, no matter the step that God wants you to take, there's always going to be this measure because we're human and it's, it's divinity and it's dirt, it's us and it's God, it's the Holy Spirit and humanity, all of that working in together, there's always going to be this component. Some people would like you to think that you just step out and you have great faith every single time and I know that I know that I know. A lot of times I don't know that I know. But I think that I think, and I kind of believe that I kind of believe, help me in my unbelief. And I've got, you know, wisdom around us, and we're making the right decision. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a point where there's the, what uh, Bob Goff, the author, calls standing at the edge of yikes. And that's what it really is. Every single time where God is leading you into something, you're going to say, man, there's going to be uncertainty there. And faith is in the action of obedience. Faith is not what the good feeling you have right before you do it. You following me? Faith is put into action. And as you do that thing, the Lord, you'll have the faith for it. And that is actually an expression of the faith that you take that next step. Our vision for the church is that every single person, all of us, the way I feel about this is if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make you do this with me. If I'm going to do this and this is my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to make you do this with me. Misery loves company. But it's also joyful and wonderful. Don't get me wrong. But all of us making that next step in God. And then together, that's how we find out what God has for us as our next as a church. All of us accepting that challenge, that invitation, that pushing out into the deep and embracing that uncertainty. Are you ready to do this together? I know you are. Let's stand together and we'll pray. I did pretty good. I only mentioned the Bengals once during that message, but I'm thinking about them right now, and I might include them in my prayers if that ever works. <laughs> I'll remind you, tonight there's an outreach vision night. I encourage all of you, I mean, when God has it on your heart for outreach and ministry and missions, you need to come to this meeting. Also, don't forget there's that life adventure guide. Uh, and you can win prizes by playing a game all around the building, learning more about the Life Adventure Guide. Also, prayer and communion down front. Our team uh, would love to join you in uh, praying for you. You know the great thing about coming forward for prayer? Besides the fact that God can touch you and heal you and, and all that, is that the parking lot clears out. And so, <laughs> whatever appeals to you. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we're so grateful to you. We're so grateful to you. I just think about, I think about, of course, all the things that you've been faithful to me in, in, in my life. And I can imagine that in this room, I just, it, just, it would, it's really amazing to think uh, how faithful you've been to all of us to bring us into this spot in our lives. And um, so, Lord, I pray this week that you would help us to have the faith and courage to invite you to push out deeper, to embrace that un uncertainty, and to take whatever that next step is that you want us to take. Show us what it is and give us just the strength to do it. Now I pray for you as God's people today. I pray that you would sense the love and joy and peace of the Holy Spirit in your homes and in your work and as you go back and forth to work in your families, that there would be real genuine joy and unity and the bond of peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.